On Super Size versus Super Skinny, we're looking at extremes of eating, both over and under. 1.6 million people suffer from eating disorders in the UK, and one of the most serious conditions is anorexia. Up to 20% of anorexics die from the illness every year, but about 40% recover completely. On tonight's show, we revisit four anorexia sufferers who took part in a radical eight-week program designed to challenge their illness and help them recover. If I don't do something about it, this will be it forever. It's like a, an evil twin, sort of sitting on your shoulder and constantly nagging at you. I hate myself for my son not seeing me as the bubbly, outgoing, full-of-life person that I was. I don't want to be Fiona the anorexic anymore. I want to be Fiona the person. And 14 months after the course finished, we're bringing them back together to see how they've got on. I am at the point now where I genuinely believe there is a life without this. <laughs> We're reuniting our four anorexia sufferers from last series to see how they've coped in the 14 months since they were last together and asking them to reflect on their experiences over the eight-week course. And they're meeting their old mentor, eating disorder dietitian, Ursula Philpott. I'm really looking forward to seeing everybody. I haven't seen them for a year and I think it would be really nice to see how they've gotten on and to get everybody back together. So, welcome everyone. Lovely to see you all again. Really Lovely good to see you as well. Yeah. The old crew. Back together. Feels kind of a long time yet. Not a long yeah, time. It <laughs> seems so easy just to slot back in with you. Mm. What do we all do with 2010? I guess that's why we're here really, for, to try and catch up with you and you know see, see how things have been for you. So, Fiona, what sort of change for you? My mindset has changed completely. Everything just seems to be about me being more positive about my life. Rather than waiting for my life to happen when the recovery ended, I've started to realise I've got to start living my life. The first time I was aware that I started to have difficulties with food was around the age of 17. I was going to be going to university and I panicked. At the start of the course, Fiona was 25, five foot five and weighed six and a half stone. Her anorexia forced her to give up her dream job as a maths teacher. When I was at university, everything was about numbers. It was a complete number game for me because I'm a mathematician. Um, I discovered calories for the first time and I could be very controlling and make sure I only had a certain number of calories. Like a lot of anorexics, Fiona became obsessed with exercise, particularly walking. There was a time when I was doing as much as three or four hours of walking a day. At one point, I had a pedometer and I could count how many steps I'd actually done. And I read in a magazine somewhere that you had to do over 10,000 steps. And so that became another of my rules. I had to walk 10,000 steps at least every day. It felt like an equation that I was putting in the numbers and the output that I expected would come out. Of course, weight's not as predictable as that. I don't want to be Fiona the anorexic anymore. I want to be Fiona the person. Thoughts about exercise, counting calories, I just don't think about it anymore. And obviously, I've got a lot of weight to put on, and I'm not going to even pretend that that's not the case, because it is. But I think now it's just a case of eating more, I think. Whilst Fiona has left her obsessions behind, how has Ashley, the youngest member of the group, fared? I mean, your, your appearance is strikingly different, dramatically different, so I'm assuming there's been some change. <laughs> um, yeah, I am, I'm, I'm eating three meals a day, every day, and I'm snacking. I'm happier, which I think kind of goes without saying I am. I'm just exactly where I want to be, and I just think that's a platform for positivity. It's a far cry from the Ashley of 14 months ago. At 20 years of age, Ashley was five foot nine and weighed just eight stone seven. Anorexia affects one in 2,000 boys compared to one in 250 girls. His bright future as a footballer fell apart after a hand injury. My dreams were shattered, I suppose. I then tried to get a grip of my life 
in other ways, and uh, food was the main focus for me then. I suppose it was my way of saying, I don't really need pastas anymore, I don't really need these carbohydrates because I don't need the energy anymore because I'm not exercising like I used to be. It bred from that and really now it is kind of more of a, an OCD thing now, to be honest with you. It's obsessional behaviour that you get with anorexia. Strange patterns form, you, you do things in a certain order, eating at certain times, not eating after a certain time. He has the same plate. He uses the same teaspoon, which sits in the same place. And it's pretty much like that every time he eats. It's just utter, utter fear of losing control. There was a time when I was doing a lot of exercise, gym work, football, and then when that stopped, there was a hole, and I needed to fill that hole. As he lost weight, he became too weak to do his usual training. So he took walking to the extreme. I'll often walk four or five miles a day and just try and walk as much as I can and make as many excuses as I can to walk. There was an excuse for going other than the real reason, but we know the reason he's going. I'm trying to earn what I eat to make it more comfortable for myself, to justify that toast, to justify the tuna salad in the evening, to justify the bit of fruit I've had at lunchtime. There always needs to be that justification in my head and the way around that is by walking. Ashley's three-year battle with anorexia has distanced him from family life. Meal times are very isolated for me. Even if I'm sitting down with the family, I always feel like there's a grey cloud hanging over us and everyone's watching me. Anorexia to me is like a cancer. It's become, it's become its own terminal illness for me. And it's just a vicious circle. I'm just turned into this resentful, bitter, unfulfilled 20-year-old. If I don't do something about it, this will be it forever. I am at the point now where I genuinely believe there is a life without this. There was a point when I wasn't like this, and why, why was that? And it's just about finding the reasons. And what about Morag? Has she managed to make many changes in the last year? I, the weekends, I make an effort to have my lunch with Lizzie and Richard, so we all sit down at the table. Um, and evening meals on a Sunday, we, we all sit down and have a meal in the evening together, which is really nice and actually how I would really like the rest of my days to be. When she embarked on the course, 36-year-old Morag was 5 foot 5 and weighed 7 stone 5. She'd lived with anorexia since her teens. Anorexia, it's like a, an evil twin, sort of sitting on your shoulder and constantly nagging at you to eat less and do more and uh, never really gives you any peace. So there's you, normal you, and there's anorexic you. I have a certain amount of walking that I have to do to sort of allow myself a certain amount of calories every day. She will walk um, particular routes, particular distances for a particular time. We're talking an hour and a half plus. It can be uh, snowing and she'll still have to go out for uh, the walk for a particular period, for a particular distance. It just sort of takes over your life before you really know where you are. I would undoubtedly describe uh, anorexia as a monster. You can take the joy out of people's lives. Morag was petrified her daughter would develop the disorder. I'm very conscious that I don't want Lizzie to pick up any of my bad habits. <laughs> but as she gets older, she'll become more aware of these kinds of things and I'm going to have to explain myself to her and I don't want to have to do that. I'm almost annoyed with myself that I put myself through it for such a long time um, when really there was no need. <laughs> and if I'd have just stopped, it would have been fine. Battling anorexia is an uphill struggle and 20 to 30% of sufferers don't respond to treatment. Roars in particular is still very much in the grip of the condition. Um, I don't think a lot's uh, really changed for me, unfortunately, as you can probably tell. And it's been really frustrating. For 37-year-old Roz, who was five foot two and weighed five and a half stone, the four years since she'd been diagnosed with anorexia had been exceedingly tough. I think anorexia stemmed from moving back to the UK and having a baby, so 
probably um, a bit of postnatal depression. I hate myself for my son not seeing me as the bubbly, outgoing, vivacious, keen, full of life person that I was. The illness changes people. It seems that other things in their life are a bit of a distraction. It makes them different people from, from what they used to be. It actually becomes very difficult not to blame the person for what you're feeling towards the illness. Roz's life was dominated by her obsession with food. It excludes you from your family, from Adam and William. They're, they're, they're eating their cheese butties and their packets of crisps and got some chips and, and I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm not. It's actually quite harrowing in a way to look at a person like that and to see what they've done to themselves and to remember how they used to look. I don't feel that I have the roles that I married and I would like her back again. I want to see her again. I wish it, I wasn't how I am, but I don't know what to do and I'm scared and I just need some help. Because as you said, you know, perhaps things haven't changed for you and maybe they're very much the same, they haven't got any worse, they haven't gotten any better. How do you feel about that? Frustrating. Nothing really has changed. Um, the only thing that they will offer me is, um, is uh, full-time, you know, inpatient, which I'm not prepared to accept. I don't doubt that it would, it would give me a push in the right direction. But I can't. I can't think of not seeing William. Yeah. I don't want to miss out on him. I don't want to not be there. No. I'll see him once a week at the weekend. Often people go in with the idea that, that they won't stay long and it's really not for them, but actually by just experiencing a, f a few weeks of, of treatment, they change their mind completely. Mm -hmm. So until you've actually experienced mm -hmm. it, I would just say be open-minded mm -hmm. and it may be life-changing. This is something that's hugely common. Um, most people with eating disorders will be ambivalent about giving up their eating disorder. So whilst it's sad, it's not something that I'm not used to seeing. One year after finishing an eight-week course with eating disorder dietitian Ursula Philpott, our four anorexia sufferers are meeting again to discuss their individual progress and reflect on how they felt during the course. My mindset has changed completely. I've got so much confidence since last year and I've just started living my life. From the very beginning, Ursula challenged the group to confront their fear of high-fat food. One of their first tasks was to go to the supermarket to help them break their cycle of behaviour towards food and move away from safe and familiar choices. The group were all given the same shopping list, an everyday task for most of us, but not so easy if food is the enemy. The shopping list I've written today deliberately includes two higher fat items, cheese and butter or margarine. They're items that the group wouldn't normally buy, and so they'll probably find them quite anxiety-provoking. I'm not a big fan of cheese, to be honest. I, I, you know, I don't really know how much to have or what kind of cheese I like. I've just not got much experience with it, I guess. For 20-year-old Ashley, who'd lost three and a half stone in three years, confronting this dairy challenge pushed him out of his comfort zone. I literally have no idea what's in any of this. I'm just... I just want to get out of here, just get whatever I need and just, I don't really want to be here, to be honest. I think the supermarket task, picking the butter, was, was difficult for a few reasons. I think because butter was a massive no-no for me. I never, I never even considered including that in my diet and then it was kind of like, I had to. There was no alternative. It was like butter or no butter. There wasn't a low-fat alternative and it was just kind of, the pressure was on and I just didn't deal with it well. I just don't need this. It's just in the way. <sighs> I need to do it, but it's, I'm literally only doing it just because I know that I should. I don't even...
such. Morag's issue with shopping was driven by obsessive compulsive tendencies, brought on by her condition. Can I just, can I just tell you what bothers me here? Um, it's when other things are on the shelves where they shouldn't be. Do you know what I mean? When people put things back where they don't come from, so that should be up there. And it just, I, I worry that that's got something in it that the thing that I'm buying might somehow absorb. It's kind of a, a, a sort of a system of beliefs I have built up over time, really. And I know that they are ridiculous. I'm, I'm well aware that, you know, things can't be absorbed into other things, but it's just a fear that has just got bigger and bigger and bigger. It's something that I think I've moved on with quite a lot um, over the, the past year. Um, I, I don't worry quite so much about what's next to what and, and how things are kind of laid out and what people have touched things and all that kind of stuff. It just doesn't really bother me so much anymore. The fear of food for anorexics can be so enormous that by the time they've actually taken the food they've bought home, the terror of eating it is insurmountable. But our courageous class agreed to face that fear head on and try the dairy products. How are you? How are you doing? The potato is quite large, but um, that's fine. I shall start it so I'll finish. It's nice to have something that tastes nice mm -hmm. um, and that you're hungry to eat. And Morag, I was interested to, to know how long it is since you've eaten a jacket potato with butter and cheese. Tens of years, not, you know, even... Sorry, it's my free. It's okay. It's fine. I don't, I'm, I, um, I'm sorry. No, don't worry, that's fantastic. It is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I know! <laughs> you've, you've got, you had a really positive attitude about it as well, and you've done really, really well. It, it, I mean, it is a big deal. I think when Morag ate the jacket potato, it was something she hadn't done in 10 years. It was an incredibly brave step, and she did very, very well. I think many people will struggle to understand just how difficult it would have been for Morag to do that. How, how, what sort of change for you in, in, in a nutshell? As far as my illness goes, um, it's, it sort of just changes. I wouldn't say it, it never really goes away. It's just uh, the degree to which it affects me. Um, it's much more controlled, I would say. As well as facing their food fears, the group had to challenge their negative body issues. And halfway through the course, that meant clothes shopping. These are just ridiculous. It hits home how thin I am when I when I see myself in, a, in an age 11 like this. For Ashley, confronting his malnourished body was a particularly difficult task. I find it difficult talking to shop assistants. I'd just rather just avoid the discomfort of sort of having to explain to a shop assistant that I need a smaller size or no, that size doesn't fit me and hearing her say, well, we don't do any smaller. It's kind of a bit embarrassing because sort of being a guy, you're expected to be a strapping man. Before anorexia, Ashley had a body he was proud of, but having lost so much weight, he struggled to find jeans that would fit him. They're huge. Unbelievable. I mean, I'd quite like to have sort of like a, a muscular tone as opposed to sort of skinny and a bit gaunt, just like I was, really. I felt I looked like a man should look. Now I kind of feel like I look like a little boy. Fiona had been battling with her body image since she developed anorexia while still at school. Most of the time when I think about going clothes shopping, it feels like I don't deserve nice new clothes. And also, I just don't feel particularly attractive. I think if I had some curves to show this dress off, it would look quite nice. It's more what I'm hopeful for. It's more about what I could wear in the future rather than how I feel about wearing it now. I remember standing in front of the mirror for it in the first time and I felt so stupid. I, was like, I felt like I was pretending to be something I'm not. I like wearing the dress now. I actually, it's one of the pieces of clothes that I really enjoy wearing. For anorexia sufferers, meals with no set portions are anxiety provoking as they are terrified of taking too much and overeating. To challenge this, Ursula laid on a tapas-style meal. Can I take some of that? Yeah, absolutely, there's plenty. <laughs> you are constantly fearful of overeating, so therefore you take very small amounts, so you can be absolutely sure 
but he didn't overeat, and I think that just makes it more difficult. As the group made their choices, Roz really struggled with her selection. That's a very tiny amount. What's going to happen if you eat it? What I'd, I would say is you need to have... A, I'd have a hunk of bread with that. That's not enough for a lunch. Just want to put some bread on. Yeah. It seems like everyone's relaxed a little bit now. We've sat down to eat, but the process of choosing was pretty tense. I just think when there's so much choice, you don't know what to choose, and it's just a bit overwhelming. It is tough to eat this, I must yeah. admit. Yeah. This is really tough. You keep thinking, oh, God, the plate's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But then I just keep reminding myself, no, I want this to be a normal portion. So I want you to feel unsafe, and I want you to feel out of control, and I want to help support you to, to manage that, to prove that you can, actually, that you can, can do, do it. it and nothing terrible will happen as a consequence. I kept thinking, well, I'm not going to suddenly explode and die, you know, disappear off the face of the earth. It's just, oh, it's just dinner. Morag and Roz found it really tough challenging their fears, so later in the course, Ursula arranged for them to receive a letter from home to remind them who they really were in spite of their anorexia. Dear Morag, I wanted to write about the things that make you who you are and which I feel have been subsumed in in the day-to-day -day life of living with your illness. <laughs> and while I know that neither of us say it often enough, I know that we both love each other. <laughs> and always remember that you are not your illness. You are so much more than that. It's difficult to hear all those things, particularly from Richard, because he puts up with such a lot of rubbish from me. It's important to believe there are positive things about me and I'm not a complete failure. So it's, it's helped to highlight that to me and that I need to be more conscious of reminding myself of those things. Dearest Ross, the reasons that I love you I know very well, but they are hard to write down. They are the reasons that have always been. They are still true, just been slightly overshadowed by your illness. You say that you are not good for William, but you really, really are good for him. I really miss you and want all of you back again so that we can enjoy the rest of our lives together to the full. Loads of love, Adam. <laughs> when Roz received the letter from her husband, it was really the first time I'd seen the emotional side and she became really quite upset. And just reading it on paper, it was incredibly difficult and not something that I enjoyed having to deal with. But that's the facts, you know, that's, that's what I'm doing to people. Once the group had gone beyond the halfway point, Ursula upped the ante and challenged them to eat out in a restaurant. For most of us, eating out is a sociable and pleasurable occasion. For somebody with an eating disorder, it can be a stressful experience that's often avoided. Not being able to eat out can lead to social isolation. And it's absolutely crucial for the group's recovery that they get over this. Eating together in a restaurant is designed to help the group break their solitary eating habits and start socialising again around food. For this task, the group had to relinquish their usual tight control over the way the food was cooked and the ingredients used. Guys, regarding the ingredients what you're using here, we have the plain butter, the soya sauce, the oil and the brandy for the steak, the, the meat. We've already got oil on it. Very it's nice. fine. It makes it taste flavor. Not fine. It is. The most difficult thing today was watching Charlie put lots of oil on that griddle. He kept putting it on, and I thought, when does it end? And I think this is my fear of going out to eat. Watching their meal being prepared was tough for them all. Slowly but surely, they managed to take a few tentative mouthfuls. I'm absolutely terrified of oil but I think it's just important to remember that it adds to the taste and that's why people use it not because it's a bad thing that's and right. they're trying to you know no. make you fat or whatever I've got the scallops here I've had some veggies but I must admit I found it exceedingly difficult watching all that oil go on there having embraced that challenge the next step was to start rebuilding their relationships by eating out with their friends and family Monkfish problem please. For Ashley, whose social life had been on hold since anorexia, this was a big step. Tonight's definitely not about anorexia for me. It's just about socialising and putting myself back out there again. 
I really want to prove to myself that I can make the most of good company and not let food dominate. What drink you have in? Have a pint of the hard stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably just have Coke. <laughs> Thank you very much. Ashley hadn't eaten pasta in four years, so despite not finishing his portion, the meal was a huge achievement for him. I haven't finished my meal, but it's because I'm genuinely full up. Like, I had, I had pasta, for Christ's sake. Like, I said I'd never eat pasta again at one point, and just so, so pleased with all this fun. It wasn't the carbs that excited me, it was the social side of it that excited me, and I think that was my first realisation that it didn't need to all be about food. For Morag, this was a rare chance to enjoy a meal out with her husband. We're going to have the spaghetti with prawns and spinach and red onion and chilli. <laughs> Yum. <laughs> and I had what I actually wanted to have, which I've wanted to have for years, probably, um, and it was absolutely delicious. Big old prawns. Mm -mm. I feel like I've moved on massively, even from a few weeks ago. I think Morang has been very relaxed this evening, much more so than, than I think she used to be. I really enjoyed going out for a meal. Um, there were lots of other people there. It wasn't just, it was quite a normal thing to do. Um, and it was nice to sort of be relaxed and being sociable instead of at home and miserable and bored, really. So, yeah, I enjoyed it. It's 14 months since our group of anorexia sufferers came to the end of a course aimed at tackling their illness. Today they're back to discuss how the year has been and reflect on the challenges they faced. Going to the spa made me feel very guilty. It was like death. I was being treated and I didn't feel like I deserved it. People with eating disorders can become experts at denying themselves any kind of indulgence and instead choosing to punish themselves and their bodies. So I've brought them to a spa so they can experience what it's like to pamper and indulge themselves and their bodies. Roz isn't able to be here today because she's unwell. This is quite common with people with low weights because the immune system has been weakened. Four years of anorexia had taken its toll on Ashley's once healthy body. As far as my body goes, I am uncomfortable with it. I've sort of come to realise that I'm probably not as desirable to look at as I was. I think his appearance is rather shocking. You see his back and under his arm. That's when you see it. It really makes you stand back and, and I live with him and it's like... I mean, it's, it's like a physically, it's like a 12-year-old boy. For some anorexics, keeping their body in a childlike state is a way of fending off the responsibilities of adult life. As I became aware that this was a way of me not having to grow up, that was not kind of an additional reason for me to carry on holding on to this, you know, control of the food. The group managed to relax in front of each other, but their next challenge was a massage. When you know that other people are going to be looking at your body and seeing your body, you are... You do sort of want to explain to them w why it's like this. I remember seeing her for, uh, for the first time and realising just how painfully thin uh, she was. I'd actually just like there to be more of her to love. It did sort of start to make me think that I have neglected my body in the past, you know, specifically not eating enough. So it's nice to have the opportunity to do something nice to my body for a change. It's really nice, very relaxing. I'm Matthew, I'm going to be your host today. Come on through. Fiona's reluctance to become a woman had meant she'd missed out on typical teenage experiences. I'm 25 years old and I've never had a relationship. So allowing someone to touch her body during the massage was an important breakthrough. Although it's like really hard to try and talk myself into pampering, when you actually do it, it feels really good. It's just very nice to be able to relax and know that it's OK. <laughs> I think my self-esteem is starting to get better 
there may be an opportunity for me to have a relationship in the future. It's just one of those things to look forward to and one of those reasons for me to get better. Particularly if I could find a bloke who'll give me back massages. <laughs> At that point in my life, I was still so convinced that I had to recover before anything could happen. But it taught me that I need to start spending more time with people, allowing other people to have some sort of space in my life. And it was only when I did start to let other people into my life that I realised, actually, that's the way to, towards recovery. Having indulged their bodies, Ursula wanted to push the group to end the day with a food indulgence. I've brought along some cakes today, which is a normal part of treating ourselves, and I'd like the group to try and eat them together. If you've got an eating disorder, then foods that represent indulgences, these are the foods that people will find particularly hard to eat. It was important to keep pushing the group, as eating more calories was their number one priority. Cream and chocolate and pastry and cake are all the things I just never, never have. My initial feelings were just of just complete fear. Like, that was, that was the most fear I felt in a challenge we've done. Even trying a small piece of cake was a major issue for them. I knew that it was this really, really scary food, and that was when my heart started to go. It was like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe I'm actually doing this. It's quite squidgy. The piece of cake was only small, but it was more about what that piece of cake represented to people than the cake itself. I just want you to try and take from that that you can do things that you find terrifying yeah. and that actually you don't even want to do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you can still yeah. do them. The reality is that having a little bit of cake now and again is not going to kill you. Despite the anxieties, they still did it, which I think shows just how far they've come really at this point. On the final week of the course, the group were asked to share a meal with their families to see how far they'd come in eight weeks. Could I have the butternut squash to start? And the leg of lamb for me. And can I have the fillet of salmon, please? Well, eight weeks ago, I actually wouldn't have even sat in, this, in a room with anybody in it, would you, really? So to be around a table with all these people is a massive step, really. Yeah. Let alone eating lamb. Yeah. So just I'm greedy now. I just, <laughs> just have to be honest. Just, 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 just turn into a pig. Well. <laughs> I think what I've started to learn is that it's okay to challenge yourself and just even just pushing yourself a little bit. It's not going to make everything fly out of control. I've seen a little bit of the old Fiona come back. She's enjoying herself a lot more. She's going out with her friends and she's becoming the old Fiona we used to know. I have learnt a lot. If I can be reinforced and keep being reinforced, come on, Ros, come on, Ros, come on, Ros, then um, he's hoping I can do it. He's hoping I can climb it. Yeah, the end result has got to be worth it. Uh, it's, it's got to be an improvement. It's got to be better. It's got to be worth it to try and get our lives back. The salmon tastes beautiful. It's really sort of delicate flavour. It's really nice. I have come a long way and it's just shown me that actually taking a risk and doing something a bit different is not the end of the world and, you know, I can, I can actually handle it quite well. And as a sign of their progress, they even managed a pud. Dig in. Dig in. Yeah. Let's do it then. That's beautiful. Oh, that's really nice. It really tastes cinnamon though. Yeah. Although recovery can be a really long and slow process, I'm really hoping that with the help and support of their families and the skills they've learned on the course, the group can go on and make a full recovery. So 14 months on, what changes have the group managed to make to their daily lives? <laughs> At only five and a half stone, Roz was the lightest of the group. Unfortunately, she's one of the 20 to 30% who struggle to recover from the grip of this illness. But she did find some support on the course. I think the positives I got from the eight-week programme were that I was with people who were suffering from the same thing and, and trying, to, trying to make it better. It gave me some motivation because I was seeing them each week. And I'd go home and I'd think, stuff it, I'm going to put butter on that piece of toast and, you know... Oh, he's crying. Being with the other three people in the group um, enabled me to open up. I think it was quite a relief to be able to do that. So although my husband is, oh, he's, he's a saint, 
you know, it, it's very difficult for him to understand. I still found it quite difficult to cope with her illness. Although she wants to, to change, she wants to get better, she's not able to do it. Um, obviously, I hope that she can get better, but the reality is that I think she needs, she needs some help. At the end of the course, Ros was offered further counselling and was strongly advised to seek inpatient care in hospital. She resisted this further support, but the course has helped her acknowledge that she needs help and she's now finally open to discussing her options. I've got an appointment to see a consultant who deals with eating disorders and runs an inpatient unit. I've agreed to go and see him and he's agreed to see me um, to see if we can come to some mutual arrangement that will help me. And since then, there's been good news. Ros has been accepted onto an outpatient programme two days a week, which means she can remain at home but still receive the ongoing medical and psychiatric care she needs to recover. And for the youngest member of the group, the last year has brought some really positive changes. I think this time a year ago, there was the habits in the sense that I had to have certain cutlery, certain plates, I'd only ever use a certain mug for my coffee, and all of them things are completely gone now. Not even I flirt with them, and I think that it's them kind of habits that I needed to change initially for there to be a big change because they were always the sort of niggling thoughts in my mind. And by breaking these habits, Ashley's attitude to food has transformed dramatically. There are things that I now thought I wouldn't be comfortable with that I am comfortable with. I'm eating curries, chilies, um, pastas. I mean, pasta was something that used to scare the living hell out of me, but now I'm, I'd gladly have a spaghetti bolognese. The whole sort of carbohydrate fear and things like that, I've just kind of got over because the lifestyle I've, I'm living now is just so fast-paced and so intense that if I wasn't to be eating these kind of things and the right kind of food, so I wouldn't be able to do it. It's not just Ashley's eating habits that have changed in the past year. His newfound confidence has seen him land his dream job. At the moment, I'm working for a television production company who ironically make a lot of food programmes. I actually think it's had a positive effect on me because when you're around professionals who deal with food and they're saying these things about food and you need these certain fats, couldn't really argue with them. Yeah. With direction in life, I'm back on the right track and uh, I think ultimately uh, it took me to find something that I really want to do to realise that I was wasting my life. His renewed love of life means Ashley's put on nine pounds and actually wants to take care of himself and build up his body. I think I'm a lot more confident with saying I'm going to the gym now because where I used to go to the gym before, on the odd occasion, it was just to get calories out of me. Now there's a goal at the end of the tunnel. I want to build myself up. I want to be a lot more masculine. I want to be a healthy weight. I want to be attractive. I want to be filled out. And I want, I want, to, I want to gain a bit more structure in my body. I think that although physically he's not where he would like to be at the moment, Mentally, it's a complete, complete turnaround, without question, in terms of him taking part in activities, not dodging things, not making excuses, there's less lying, it's got to come from him. And now he's started to realise that he's started to come out the other side of it, so the progress is there. And I'd say in a year's time, you know, who knows, it could be all but gone. A year on, the most positive thing I've seen change in Ashley is his personality. He's got a spark back in his eye, and that means more to me than anything. He socialises more. He was very reclusive when he was at his worst. I feel extremely proud of what Ashley's done. He's not done this for me or anybody else. He's done it for himself. I'm a lot, a lot happier. I have still had to address the issue in hand, because at the end of the day, it isn't just going to go away without a conscious effort, and I think that it's just become a lot easier to, to, to deal with that because I've had other things on my mind. It's a case of, essentially, if I don't eat, I can't live the lifestyle I want to live. And I think that's ultimately what it's come down to. I've had to make a choice between getting on in my life or not eating. It's just light at the end of the tunnel, I think. And I think I realised that I could be free of this completely. A year after finishing an intensive course to tackle their illness head-on, we're catching up with our four anorexia sufferers to see how they've got on. 
For Morag, who's had anorexia since her teens, did the eight-week program help change her attitudes towards food? It definitely gave me more confidence. I've been more willing to try new things, and, and that's been a direct result of being on the program. Uh, one egg fried rice, one mushroom curry. We have takeaways quite regularly, and it's not stressful. No, I think not only do I not feel stressed by it, but it's less stressful for everyone else because they know I'm not stressed about it either, so it's not, not so, nearly as so much of a big deal as it used to be. And it's nice. <laughs> it's nice to have takeaways. Um, I really like Chinese. Morag's even managing to keep her obsessional compulsive tendencies under wraps. If Richard put some marge or something like butter or cheese or something on this shelf, I would normally kind of panic and and probably not eat the things that had been near to it and all that kind of stuff. But no, it wouldn't really bother me. You know, it's not going to make any difference to anything, so stop worrying about it. And over the last year, her approach to exercise has completely changed. I think I used to feel that I had to be on the go all the time, and that's, that's definitely how my sort of illness affected me, that I felt I couldn't eat unless I'd been running around, running around all day. Um, and I, there's, there's still a certain amount of that. It, it niggles me a little bit, and I think, oh, you really shouldn't be sitting here. And I just think, oh, so you know, it doesn't matter quite so much, and I'm, I'm just able to be calmer about it. <laughs> this has enabled her to find time to enjoy other activities. I have been able to spend a lot more quality time with, with Richard and Lizzie. I have a lot more time at the weekend to be here and to be with, with them too, rather than off doing walks. I'm definitely glad that I took part in the eight-week plan. Certainly at the time it helped me a lot um, and retrospectively it's helped me um, see that I'm able to do things that I didn't necessarily think I could do. And what about Fiona? When we first met her, she was desperate to escape the clutches of her condition. Now she's dramatically changed the way she views her situation. The big thing that's changed for me is that a year ago, I was still thinking, right, when I've recovered, my life can begin. I was waiting to recover so that I could start living my life. I realised that actually it doesn't have to be recovery and then life. Life is what's happening day to day and I've got to stop letting things pass me by. I think more by pouring my energies into living my life, um, the anorexia gradually gets pushed out the door because there isn't enough space for it anymore. The fear of food that used to dictate her life is now firmly behind her. I can't think of foods now that I'm actually afraid of eating. The two big fear foods that I had, pasta and pizza, really not fear foods for me anymore. I don't know what all the fuss was about. <laughs> The difficulty now, though, is more about um, just feeling full all the time. But I am certainly a lot better when I'm hungry, thinking, right, I need to eat now. And there's been a huge change in Fiona's attitude to eating. Whereas before she'd only eat on her own, now she sees a whole new social side to food. As much as possible, I try and eat with other people. The social side of it feels much less um, anxiety-provoking, and that's so much nicer. I also started to realise that I'm actually a more social person than I thought I was. I think the anorexia made me into such an antisocial person. Being in a room with lots of other people would have been hugely frightening for me. And that's, that's just not the case anymore. I don't even have to think about it now. The insular, unassured Fiona of last year has managed to open up and, more importantly, let others into her life. I always said that I would recover first and then maybe that would happen some way down the line. But I found someone who I can get on with hugely well, you know, we just have so much in common. And he's just been hugely supportive. He, he wants to see me get better. He also makes me want to not be anorexic anymore. He allows me to see what my life might look like more long term. Having someone so close has done wonders for her confidence. Steve makes me feel more attractive. He just makes me feel so wonderful about myself. I did not think that I was someone who was lovable <laughs> at all. And to have someone telling me that I am, it allows me to think that perhaps maybe there is something about me that is lovable. It had been 150% change in her. She's far, far more confident, far happier. 
I'm getting my daughter back. The one that used to eat with us, the one that would eat anything, the one that loved food, that enjoyed food, and that daughter is coming back to me now. And it's, it's lovely, absolutely wonderful. When I think about the future now, I can see a future for myself without the anorexia, and I, I hold very dear to that. I know that my future does not involve anorexia. It's just a case of getting there. I'm just going to keep fighting this until, you know, I get over it. And there's, there's never any... Um, moment where I think to myself, well, what if I never get over it? I know that I will get over it. The levels of recovery amongst the group have varied enormously, but there's no doubt that Ursula's treatment plan has had a positive effect on all of them.